Hey, thanks for being here this morning. Uh, You know what? I'm asking the same thing. What just happened? <laughs> hey, let's, let's do something a little different. Normally, I pray later on. Can we pray right now? Would you pray with me? God, thank you for your love. Thank you for uh, this opportunity. Thank you for right now. God, we know that this, this life that you've given each of us is, is not something that we should ever take for granted because, God, we know that this was something that was absolutely inspired by you, that this is something that you made happen um, that you you did all the you did all the groundwork you did all the planning you did you did everything uh, for us to be right here right now so God we were thankful we recognize that this life that we have it's it's truly uh, from you God we're thankful that not only we do we understand that this life is from you but God we have the opportunity now to recognize you with our life so God thank you for the opportunity we have to be able to live our lives. For you and for your glory. Thank you for times like this where we can gather together in a building uh, and call ourselves your church and, and uh, do our best. Sometimes it's shoddy, but we do our best to be able to show the world what love and what grace looks like. Thank you for that love of yours that, that changes hearts, that melts them, that breaks them, but also rebuilds them. Thank you for the opportunity we have to be able to come together and to be able to, to worship you, to be able to tell you thanks through many different ways. God, we want you to be our focus this morning. Thank you for your love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, as we enter into this time of worship, I'm just going to ask that uh, do you find freedom in how you do it. Certainly it is true. The reason why we live is because he does. Well, I believe in the sun And I believe in the risen one And I believe I overcome By the power of his blood And I'm then and I'm in. Well, I'm alive, I'm alive because He lives. I'm in. And I'm in. Well, let my song join the one that never ends because He lives. Because he lives Well I was dead in the grave And I was covered in sin and shame But I heard mercy call my name And he rolled the stone Because he lives, amen, and amen. Well, let my song join the one that never ends, amen, and amen. Well, I'm alive, I'm alive. Because 
applause for Christy Alexander and Max Williams living new lives this morning. Amen. Proud of you ladies. Super proud of you and how cool that is that that just totally works into what we were talking about. So thankful for lives changed and these two ladies that were willing to step it up and say, hey, I want to devote my life to Christ. I, I want to just be a Jesus follower for the rest of my days and so proud of you two ladies, and, and as their church family, may we surround them by, with love. May we do our best to be good examples. Uh, so we have that great opportunity. I don't know, I mean, geez, I'm sure Christy is a sweetheart in herself, but if you know Max Williams, whoo, she's a looker, first of all. But I tell you what, there is nobody that shows love like that lady. So how incredible that she would say, you know what? I want to live my life for him. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Sing a church. Your 
praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry and these bones will sing they'll sing great are you lord sing it out church and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry and these bones will sing they'll sing great It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. Yes, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. And great are you, Lord. And great are you, Lord. So I, I, I don't oftentimes think about things before I say them, as you are fully aware. So when I said that Max is quite a looker, Max, I love you, but I'm happily married. What I mean by that is if you don't know Max, you haven't seen a very beautiful person. Because Max is beautiful from the inside out. And that's what I mean about Max. Max is one of those people that has been so constant. Now, I know, she'll, I know she would probably be shaking her head back there. And that's why I'm so glad it's dark in here. But you know what? Max is one of those people that has been so constant. And she's always been one of those people that I can call on to do different tasks. And she always says, yes, this, starting today, I will accept no's for Max. Um, but you know what? It's just she has this love to serve, and she has this love for God, and she has this love for people. And that is the one thing that I found for myself to, to, that I understand that Max is so attractive. It's because she has these qualities that only come from God. And so she is one of my go-to people. I, and you know what? So that's when I said she's quite a looker. Well, she is. But she would also tell you that, that that steadfastness that she has, even through the death of her, of her husband, it's because of God. So, Max, I love you. Thank you for letting me talk about you. These are the moments that most people cower and they hate, and I understand. But I wanted to explain that to you, that, you know what, God intends us. We can be beautiful, but God really wants our beauty to come from the inside. That stuff that he gives us that makes us so attractive that people just want to talk to you because they know something's just different. What is it about you that makes you so different? How do you explain the hope that you have? How do you explain the peace that you have? How, how do you explain the fact that as you weather storms, God still has a hold on you and, and people can see that. That's your witness. That's your story. That's your testimony. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, well, I believe that you are my fortress, and you are my portion, and you are my hiding place, and I believe you are the way, the truth. The life, and I believe you are 
Is this the microphone you wanted me to use, Jeff? That is it. Well, another Sunday. Hopefully this one's a little bit different than uh, what you guys have experienced before because there was a, uh, an adult finger painter on stage. Uh, my name's Cody, and I, I think the easiest way to, to lose a, an audience, a congregation in Ohio, is to tell them where I'm from. <laughs> Somebody said it. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I was one of uh, Jason Watson's youth group kids back in the day, so if I do well here, um, that's because I've worked really hard. And if this goes really bad, uh, this is a product of him. <laughs> so my, my name's Cody Sable. I'm from Pittsburgh. I went to Norwood Christian Church. I grew up all the way through that church, and then I... And then I followed in Jason's footsteps to Kentucky Christian University, where I played football. And the first time I ever did a live painting on stage it is in the uh, summer of 2009. And the summer of 2009, uh, not to make anyone feel old, but I think I was 13 turning 14. <laughs> and I... Uh, I'd never done anything live on stage, and I went to Summer in the Sun, which is a, a program held by Kentucky Christian University. Our, our, your, your youth has go, uh, goes there a few times, and I've seen them there uh, last summer, so, so you guys are familiar with Summer in the Sun. And, and I went with Jason back when he was uh, youth pastoring in Pittsburgh. 
And there was this guy on stage who was painting live for everybody. And I remember being uh, 13, turning 14 in the middle of that week. And I remember watching him, and I thought that that guy was the coolest guy in the world. Turns out he's okay. He's okay. <laughs> I remember watching him, and I was thinking, like, man, like, I've always loved to, to draw. And I always, like, I always was in my room, and I was drawing different things. I was drawing a lot of Pittsburgh sports, uh, you know, a lot of Pittsburgh sports athletes that you guys all love. And um, <laughs> go, Penguins. go Penguins. Yeah, right here in the front. Awesome. And I remember drawing, and when I saw that guy up on stage, I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. And a few Sundays later, we threw this thing called Generation Sunday. It's when the youth ran church for a Sunday. Or we, my dad likes to call it the, the one week of the year we don't go to church. <laughs> and I went on stage, and I drew this hand at the beginning of the service. And Jason had this message, and I, I remember the message so well. This is the only message I think I remember from, from, those, from, from the pulpit on Sunday morning. I remember all his, his, his youth lessons, but from Sunday morning, that was the time where I got to rest and relax. But Jason got up, and I remember he played this video uh, of, of a baseball game where Armando Galarraga was throwing out uh, a, a perfect game. Is this starting to, does anybody start to remember this? He was throwing a perfect game. If you don't know who Armando Galarraga is, it's because he's only known for one game. In, in the ninth inning, with, with two outs left, a perfect game on the line. And a perfect game is when not a single batter from the other team reaches base. Either on an error, on, on, a, on a hit, on, on whatever. Not a single person on base. It's only been done about 22 times in the history of Major League Baseball. And Armando Galarraga throws this pitch with two outs in the ninth inning, and it's a ground ball to first base, and he goes to cover the bag, and he catches it, and the guy's out, and the umpire calls him safe. And Jason preached this message of how the next game, the same umpire, the same two teams, Armando Galarraga was the guy that they chose to hand out the lineup card after this umpire knew he just completely blew the game. And it was this moment where Armando Galarraga and the umpire with tears in his eyes because he knew this was a, a lifetime achievement, a generational thing. He would go down in, in, in single game baseball history for this perfect game. And with tears in his eyes, Armando Galarraga forgives him. And Jason preached this message of forgiveness. And at the end of the service, I walked back up, and we had like a ketchup bottle with red paint, and it. it wasn't ketchup. And we wrote forgiven over top of it, and we put a red dot in the middle of his hand, and it dripped down to show Jesus and what he did on the cross for us, taking the nails in his hand. So, so that was the first time I ever painted. And you guys probably have an image in your head of what that painting looks like. But just take that painting that you have in your head and make it horrible. Because two, two, three, four, that was 2009, and we flash forward to 2015, and I'm at Kentucky Christian University, and I'm going there for a preaching degree and, and a uh, biblical studies degree, and, and I played football. And if you went to Kentucky Christian University, you were kind of weird if you went to that school and you didn't play a sport. We were really trying to up our sports program, so all I did was work out for football. I studied because the classes and the programs were pretty rigorous. They were pretty intense. And it was this monotony, the same thing over and over again. And I was doing anything at this point to get away from it. I had stopped drawing. I didn't really focus on that because my number one goal was to be a great football player at the University of Kentucky Christian, which is totally backwards, and I don't know why I said it that way. <laughs> That's all I wanted to do. So in, in an effort to get away from doing the same thing over and over again, I started drawing. And nobody knew that I was okay at drawing. 
So when people started to notice this, I started hanging out with a group of people that formed a band at KCU, uh, a, a Christian band that would go around and they would play at, at, at our chapels on Tuesday and Thursday. They would paint at this, uh, this event every month called Grounds and Sounds, where it's just a night where you can come out to the terrace and have some coffee and listen to a live band. And, and my musician friend comes up to me and he asked me, he said, do you want to do some live painting on stage? And I said, no, not in front of my schoolmates, not in front of like these people that, you know, everybody knows everybody. It's a campus of like 600 people. Like we all know each other. I don't want to get up there and embarrass myself. And then he said, you know, I'll, um, you know that paper in Dr. Baldwin's class? I'll write yours. <laughs> and I said, okay. So I went up there and, and we took like a music stand, just like this, and we leaned it against the wall. And I went to Kmart, the only store around, and we looked for something that I'd be able to paint on and we found these $3 foam boards. And we took it and we leaned it on here and against the wall and I did these paintings. I only had one color, the color purple. And I painted exactly what the dude from Sits in 2009 painted on the cork board. And eventually got a Facebook message saying, if you sell that, you're in big trouble. <laughs> but I remember doing these paintings. I was on stage doing these paintings. And it was two of them. It, one was like an eye and the other one was like an interlocking hand. And I remember thinking that these paintings are terrible, but I love being up here. Like, this is, the, this is the coolest thing in the world. Despite what the paintings looked like, it felt like so natural, and I've had more fun than I've ever had on the football field, because I was small and I got beat up often. More fun than I've ever had was on that stage, playing with my friends in a ministry-type setting, and, and I felt like I had something to offer the world that was bigger than touchdown passes or sacks, tackles. I felt like I had something that I really had a passion to work on. And I don't think I spent a day after that not painting something. And I, and I, and I did my best to, like, to, to beg to go onto the chapel stage, which is like, you know, big time at KCU. So I, I was begging to go on the chapel stages, and they finally let me, and I kept growing, and I remember they eventually, KCU was so generous, they gave me like a studio space, a space that was my own, that I could just go in there and paint, because they believed in me too. And eventually, I remember my senior year, uh, we're, we're heading into the spring semester of 2017, and they give me this entire dorm building because we didn't have enough students to fill all the dorms, so this dorm was left kind of empty, and I just set my stuff down in the lobby, and they gave me a key. They gave me a key that said Cody Sable, and the, the, the key card said special on it, so I was like, oh, wow, that's really nice of you guys. Um, and what I thought was that the building was condemned. Because when you turn the sink on, it was brown. And when you would like, there was asbestos and mold in the place. So I thought this place was condemned. So I started painting on the walls. <laughs> I started doing murals on the walls. And I remember the guy that gave me the key walked in and he said, you're gonna have to clean this up next semester. And then the next semester I started my internship at Pitt and I haven't been back since. <laughs> and I always thought that when I think about what I do in reality, a lot of people uh, have affirmed that this is kind of a neat thing, that this is kind of different, and, and, and this kind of shows Christ in, 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 a, in a perspective that not a lot of people see. There's other people like me that do this. And it's always cool to see something visual. A lot of what we hear is, is what we hear from a microphone and, and what we see from, from music and being on stage. And there's not a lot of people that paint live and, and can uh, tell stories. And, and, and these things that I'm working on to be able to, to just preach and do whatever. But it didn't start. It started so small. And it started like just with 
an ounce of a, of a push, and a push that I attribute to the Holy Spirit. And I was just this weird kid from Pittsburgh that just drew because he wanted to get away from football. And I had trouble. I had trouble thinking, like, is this going to, to be something? Am I going to be able to, to do this? Like, now, when things started turning out good, I kind of set my dreams really high. And, and it's when I started setting my dreams really high is when I had to lean on God the most because I, I can't do this on my own. Every time I painted, it seemed like it was getting a little bit better. And I felt like that couldn't be naturally just because of me. There has to be something inside of me that God seems to like. And he gave me this thing, and I'm so appreciative of it. And I, and I kind of never got, like, why, why me? Why does this happen? And, and there's this story that I really want to get into. This is by far the craziest story in the Bible. And that's why I came here to tell it to you guys. <laughs> We're going to be in Judges chapter 3 this morning. Judges chapter 3, like I said, has my favorite story in the Bible. It's the weirdest story in the Bible. And I'm, I might read it and you might go, that's not the Bible. It is. NIV Bible, Judges chapter 3. We're going to start here in verse 12. We're going to introduce a guy named Ehud, but I'm going to paint the picture real quick while you guys are turning there. I don't know if you guys have your Bibles on your phone, or you can just listen to me. Totally fine with me. Ehud is a Benjamite, and Ehud is in the tribe of Benjamin. He, he's, he's this guy who is, is fairly young. They describe him as like a younger guy, and Israel is kind of going back and forth with God. So the back and forth that we see with Israel right now is ever since the time with Abraham and, and, and this nation of Israel was born, Israel would sin, they would beg for forgiveness because God would allow countries to come in and overtake Israel. <laughs> I'm just messing with you, man. <laughs> he would allow countries to come in and take Israel to punish them. Because God knows when people go through struggles, it's in that struggle that people lean on God the most. So the people come together and they, and they ask God, they're crying out to God, God, please send a deliverer to save us. And right before we get to Ehud, he sends a guy named Othniel. And Othniel slays the king, the captives are free, Israel is saved again. However... Israel never stays one with God. They start sinning. They start living idol like in idolatrous ways. They start breaking that connection that they had with God. So God rises up this nation. He, says he raises up the nation of Moab. And Moab, led by this awful dictator, King Eglon, they come in and they sweep the land and they overtake Israel. And for 18 years, they're subject to Moab. And, and that's, that's where we're going to start here. Verse 12, it says, Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And because they did this evil, the Lord gave King Eglon of Moab power over them. Getting the Ammonites and the Amicalites to join him. Eglon came in and attacked Israel and they took Possession of the city of Palms. The Israelites were subject to Eglon, king of Moab, for 18 years. And again, the Israelites cried out to the Lord, and they gave them a deliverer, Ehud, a left-handed man, the son of Gera, the Benjamite. And the Israelites sent him with tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now, there's a few things in there already that we need to kind of stop and talk about, because it's important to know that it mentions that Ehud is left-handed. And, and that might not mean anything to us, because how many of you guys are in here are left-handed? We got a proud left-handed person right here in the second row. How many, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. There's a lot of us in here, but, but in most nations, in most tribes, if you were left-handed, you were not able to serve your country in the way that people were able to serve. And if you were a man and you were left-handed, that, that situation couldn't be worse. 
You were almost stripped of your manhood if you were left-handed. And, and, and in this translation, it doesn't mention it, but in other translations, the Hebrew word that I'm not going to try to pronounce because I'm not going to get it right means that he is shut of his right hand. So not only is he left hand, he's forced to grow up left hand because more than likely there was something wrong with his right hand. And the reason that, they, that being left handed was an issue was because in the style of fighting that was back in the day. Have you ever seen like the Revolutionary War pictures where they would all line up in a, in a row in their red coats? Doesn't that seem so weird? Like now we have like camouflage and basically we're invisible out in the, out in the wilderness. Like we, we, we don't fight like that anymore. But back in the day, we fought in rows. And this goes back generations, millenniums, people fighting in rows. And that's how they would do it. They would line up side by side and they would draw the sword with their right hand from their left hip. That's where they kept it. So when you would draw your sword and you were fighting, it posed a danger if you were swinging in the same direction as somebody else over here. You get your arms cut off. So Ehud is not a man in this scenario. And I'm sure he's dealt with some issues growing up with other kids you know how kids can be. Especially in a generation that prides itself on being the strongest and the most powerful. If you were a soldier, you were a man, and if you weren't a soldier, you didn't grow up the easiest. Yet somehow Ehud makes himself useful to the Benjamite army, and he's, he's delivering this message to King Eglon himself. He's going with people. So my thinking is, he's a witty guy, he's a very wise man, and he finds himself in these situations that he can be used. So we're going to continue. Again, the Israelites cried out to the Lord and gave him a deliver. Ehud, a left-handed left man, son of Gera, the Benjamite, and the Israelites sent him with tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Ehud had made a double-edged sword about a cubit long, which he strapped to his right thigh under his clothing. He presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab, who was a very fat man. The Bible after Ehud had presented the tribute, he sent on their way to those who had carried it. But on reaching the stone images near Gilgal, he himself went back to Eglon and said, Your Majesty, I have a secret message for you. And the king said to his attendants, Leave us. And they all left. Ehud then approached him while he was sitting alone in the upper room of his palace and said, I have a message from God for you. And as the king rose from his seat, Ehud reached with his left hand, drew the sword from his right thigh, and plunged it into the king's belly. And even the handle sank in after the blade, and his bowels discharged. <laughs> the Bible. <laughs> then Ehud went out to the porch. He shut the doors of the upper room behind and locked them. And after he had gone, the servants came and found the doors of the upper room locked. And they said, he must be relieving himself in the inner room of the palace. And they waited to the point of embarrassment. And, but when he did not open the doors of the room, they took a key and unlocked them where they saw their Lord fall into the floor dead. There's a lot of cool stuff in there. There is a, a lot of cool stuff in there. And, and I think the first question that we have to ask ourselves in this Bible story is, how does Ehud get away with seeing the king with a sword strapped to his hip? I mean, I don't know about you, but TSA pats everyone down a little more than they should 
And that's just for the plane. They're, we're talking about seeing the president of the United States on a level that King Eglon is, the leader of this nation, one of the strongest nations of the time, Moab, and the guards aren't going to pat him down? Historians believe that this is what happened. Ehud's a left-handed man. And Ehud wouldn't keep his sword on his right hip. Or on his left hip, excuse me. He'd keep it on his right. So he could pull it out and use it. Um, Lily, you said that you would help me out. Lily, Watson, come on. I'm going to demonstrate something real quick. He would have his sword on his right hip. But when you were seeing the king, they would simply go like this because he was showing him a message. We're just going like this. It was somebody he trusted. So Ehud goes in almost unannounced. And this is how they would tell secrets back in the day. Back in the day, they would tell secrets like this. You would take your sword-wielding hand... And you'd place it on the shoulder of the person that you're telling the secret to, and you would do the same thing. It was a sign of trust. So Ehud puts his hand here. Egon puts his hand here. It's okay. Go ahead. No, other hand. <laughs> Just like that. And through it, Ehud pulls out the sword and plunges it into the belly of King Egon. You can go sit down. Thanks, Lily. Yeah, clap for it. Go ahead. He has his right hand on the shoulder of King Eglon. This weird, deformed shoulder. Eglon's probably like, eh. And he takes his sword and finishes it. There's a few things that also kind of get me in this, in, in this story. King Eglon, when he approaches, because, because Ehud has a message from God, this, this brutal dictator who was a pagan by all means, actually stands up and recognizes God in this story. For Ehud to just stand there and be able to fulfill the duties that God has for him. And the story finishes by Ehud leaves like, like, a, like a bandit, like a thief in the night. He goes out to the porch, he shuts the door, and he, and he runs outside and he meets back up with his friends in Gilgal and lets them know what has happened. And the situation is so perfect because King Eglon, he's just going to the bathroom. He is relieving himself in the inner palace of the temple. He's going to the bathroom because they can smell what happened when that sword went into him and his bowels were charged. And those guards on the outside were like, you don't pay me enough to go in there and check on him. Just enough time for Ehud to escape miles down the road where the victory trumpets would soon play because they go back in their march and they hear what happened and Israel takes back what was theirs. And this story with Israel doesn't end there. They, they sin again, and, and they, they, get captive, uh, they get captivated again by, by different tribes. This is a, a, a sequence that happens over and over in the Bible. Uh, but the one thing that I identify with more than anything of this story is, is that Ehud and his disadvantage, Ehud and his left-handedness, Ehud growing up knowing that there's a good chance he wasn't going to make much of himself. Ehud growing up with people teasing him, and Ehud growing up knowing that there was a chip on his shoulder that he needed to prove himself, because it wasn't often that people who weren't like you were promoted to such high levels, high statuses back in the day, especially with a guy who they claimed had a deformity. But God, constantly, throughout this book, 
tells us that he, better than anyone, can take a disadvantage and turn it into an advantage. God so often uses the weird people in the Bible, the people that aren't qualified. He used Abraham, who was just a pagan guy, to start the entire nation of Israel, the father of Israel. Used plenty of people. And one person that I want to talk about today is a guy from a band that I used to to work with. Uh, I used to do some drawings for this band uh, a few years ago. And uh, have, have, have you guys heard of 10th Avenue North? The, there's, there's a story. If you have a chance, go look up this story. Uh, Mike Dunahee is their lead singer. And, and we got to talking one day at Summer in the Sun. And he had, had told us this big story about how he got started. He got started because he was a Division I soccer recruit. And he was on his way to a big tournament uh, in Ohio. And he was on his way there. And he was, they, they were driving. And all of a sudden... The truck in front of him, the back broke off of it, and all this stuff in the back came out of it, and they're going 70, 80 miles per hour, and they swerve out of the way, and they hit a ditch, and the car flips, and Mike wakes up in the hospital. He can't move. He's just laying there, lifeless. Was told he was going to be paralyzed and would never walk again. He was on his back for six months, resting, getting surgeries, doing everything the doctors could do to fix him. And while he was on his back, he picked up a guitar for the first time at the age of 18. And he taught himself how to play the guitar, and he taught himself how to sing. And his soccer mates, his, his, his teammates, two of them decided we should start a band. And when he got to college, he met two other people, and they became this band known as 10th Avenue North. And the last time I saw 10th Avenue North was at PBG Paints Arena, where the Penguins play, because God said, Mike, I am not done with you. There is stuff that I have for you that's beyond your wildest dreams. And Mike's playing in front of 20,000 people sometimes. I saw him on a tour in 2014 for their cathedrals tour. And he looks like he is living the coolest life because God said, I am not done with him. God took this tragic story, this disadvantage where Mike thought he was never going to walk again. He used this tragedy to bring Mike more than he could have ever imagined. The next guy I want to kind of talk about is a guy named Nick Vujicic, who's a popular Christian Author and, and, and Mike is just, uh, and Nick is one of the coolest stories, and you might have seen him. Uh, he's hard to not recognize. Mike or Nick has no arms or legs. He has two little feet at the base of his torso, and that's how he gets around. And Nick grew up knowing how much of a burden he was to his parents. And he was brutally teased at school. He had a difficult time making friends. And by the time he was 12 years old, Nick had tried to end his life twice. And it was in the bathtub one night as he was trying to end his life that the Holy Spirit reached out to him, and what he says was the first time he's felt God say that, I'm not done with you, Nick. There's so much more. And after that, Nick got plugged into his local youth group, and he, and he realized he had a story 
to tell that kids were so interested in his church youth group that that he, he wrote down a little story and he would go and preach about the struggles and he would start visiting hospitals and start visiting local cities with, with places, with centers, with kids just like him. And he would go and he would talk to them and say, hey, listen, it is not all bad. Let me tell you about Jesus. And now Nick goes from country to country. He's spoken in front of over four million people telling his story about how God is using him a person without arms or legs, somebody who is deemed unworthy by people, his peers, his, his family, his, his, everybody that was around him gave him the short end of the stick. Oh, man, that's a bad pun. People believed that he wasn't going anywhere, that he would have to be taken care of. And Nick turned his disadvantage, and he started going around and telling people that, I don't care what you have in your life, God is bigger than what's going on with you right now. And, and all these people in, in the Bible that we read are just ordinary people. So when I was deciding whether I was going to start doing this, I, I looked at people like Mike and Nick Realizing that I didn't have to go through anything tragic. I just believed I was just a normal, ordinary guy. And when I started really looking at the people that God used in the Bible, I had realized they were just normal, ordinary guys. But they all had a similarity. They all said yes when God asked them of something. And it might have been after some pain and some thought and, a, and maybe a ton of no's. But eventually, they started saying yes, and God used them. My own testimony is that I said, God, I love doing this. And I want to grow in this talent. I want to grow in this skill. I want to work on this as hard as I possibly can. But Lord, I want you to put the opportunities to do this out there because I can't do it by myself. And I was talking to a pastor and he, and he said, what's your, what's your biggest dreams? And I said, I don't know. I just want to paint for Jesus. And he said, look, your dreams ought to be so big that they'll fail if God's not with you. And when you're succeeding, just know that it has nothing to do with you, that it's all God. And I was like, mm, that's, I don't know about that. And then I spent some time where I got a little fool of myself. And I started doing stuff for guys like Sidney Crosby and Ben Roethlisberger, Antonio Brown, Cam Hayward. And I worked at a church that was not very good for me. And I kind of put the Bible away for a little bit and started doing things on my own. And the more I started doing things on my own, the more success I seemed to get. And, and this is the most dangerous kind of success because it wasn't kingdom success. It wasn't preaching the gospel success and, and listening to other people's testimonies and being with other people in the church. It was, no, I got it this many Instagram likes. I got a news camera on me. I got recognition from some of the most popular people in my city. I'm, I'm going to all these different events. And what I realize is that like, the more I keep chasing, the more empty I, I feel. Because I started making this about me. 
And when you make it about you, you're never going to be satisfied. And I had to teach myself this lesson. That it doesn't matter how many people you're in front of or the, the, the status of the people in the room or how much money they're willing to give you. God looks at me up here on stage uh, painting these pictures and, and the same way that God's looking at somebody that just knows how to fix a car on the side of the road because God gave us all each individual talents, each a uniqueness that most people might say, that's a disadvantage, that's something weird about you. But God is truly using those things equally. God doesn't care how many Instagram followers that I got because I can paint something in 12 minutes. God cares about, am I doing everything that I can with the talents that he gave me to further his kingdom? And my, my challenge to you is to find that uniqueness that you have inside yourself because that is what God gave you. That is what makes you special. That thing that you can do just naturally. Like, are you good at working on cars? Can you do that for other people for my kingdom? Are you good at knitting? Can you make this guy a hat because he's cold? Last time I gave this message, I gave three really similar. I, I was like knitting and like sewing, and I was all over the clothes making thing. But whatever you can do, God wants to use that for his kingdom. The thing that makes you weird God wants to use. I am an adult finger painter, people. <laughs> God made me a little weird. And God uses the weird people. And you should be proud of how weird you are. Jeff is worshiping in a sleeveless flannel. There are some churches that look at you weird if you walk in the building and you're wear, you aren't in a suit. God uses the weird in people. God used Moses, who couldn't talk real well, gave God every excuse in the book, and said, God, I just can't do it because I don't talk real well. Well, we'll use your brother Aaron to do the talking. And Moses was like, dang it. <laughs> All right, fine, I'll do it. And then God was like, okay, maybe Moses, you do sound really weird. And then there was David, who was just too young. who was too young, kind of a wimpy kid because of his age. But David said, I'll do it. That guy, that guy that can probably kill me, not even going to touch me. The weird, wimpy kid turned into King David. Uh, the disciples, their education was in fishing. They were fishermen on the Sea of Galilee. They weren't very smart. They weren't very bright. Paul killed people. Paul was a person that would drag Christians out of their home and kill them until Acts chapter 9 when God appears to him on the road to Damascus. Paul was a messed up person until he met Jesus. Every person in this Bible was going through something that God used as an advantage for his kingdom. So what makes you weird? What makes you unique? Tap into those things because it, it wasn't an accident. Find the stuff that makes you different and use it for God's kingdom. I don't care if it's juggling. Do whatever you can. Do whatever you're good at and make your neighbor's day because of it. And God promises the same reward for those who are preaching in front of 35,000, is the person that is just willing to go the extra mile to help a neighbor. 
I think when we get to heaven, we are going to be greatly surprised. Greatly surprised by the people that God has shown favor to because of their heart. And I just want to thank you for, for being a church. That is a little weird. I want to thank you guys for being people that are as welcoming as can be. Because there is nothing a bunch of weird Jesus lovers can't do. A bunch of people who are perfectly unique in their own way, coming together to worship the God that uses weird and broken people like ourselves to go do what he needs us to do. God doesn't need us to go out and, and, and do these big things. God allows us to participate in his kingdom and he allows us by just saying, hey, I need you to go help out this one person. Go use your weird thing and go make somebody's day and share about the love while you're doing it. Be a blessing to somebody because of who you are and our differences and our brokenness and our uniqueness. This story in Judges chapter three finishes with the trumpet of victory sound in all of Israel, letting them know that they are free once again because of a weird guy with a shut right hand who didn't believe that he had a disadvantage but because he was with God God showed him that being near with God is the true advantage and we should all take advantage of the opportunity that Jesus Christ allowed us to have. I'm gonna pray for us, and then the band's got one more song, one or two more songs for you guys. Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity that we can come together as a community, as a group, worship you exactly who we are broken different and unique but perfect in your eyes Lord you created us to be different from one another and in that difference you said this is not just some pointless weird unique thing I made in you this serves a purpose somehow, in some way. Lord, I thank you that we can use what makes us weird to further your kingdom. We love you and we will continue worshiping your great name always. It's in your son's name I pray, amen.